Over the last few years, deconstruction has been a big word on YouTube and on online articles. Everywhere you go, you hear people talking about, quote unquote, deconstructing their faith. What does a deconstruction mean? Was it ever constructed? And what are some of the reasons why the uh, laity leaves the church? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked. And let's explore it as we watch our culture stray further every day. Howdy, Jonathan Fiala for Further Every Day here with Charlie. How's it going? It is going well. We're doing a really, really simple day to day, but we're going to kind of dive into the five questions. And I'm, I'm going to give them all to you. I'm not going to keep you waiting. The problem of evil, mm -hmm. Christians within the walls of the church, the God of the Old Testament, the anti-intellectualism in the church, and of course, number five, the desire for personal autonomy or freedom. There you go. Episode wrapped. You guys can go now. <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't the, do that. Well, if you want to hear a response from the Christian faith and the Christian worldview and be better prepared to answer someone, or maybe you have this question yourself, stick around and uh, we'll be bookmarking this probably. And I do think we'll be probably cutting these up and putting them out as individuals. So- Let's start off with a, with a difficult one. The problem of evil is often cited as an impediment to a perfect God who is all loving, all good, all knowing. How could a perfect God, all knowing and all powerful, allow evil? Either he is not all powerful, but he's all good, so he's weak and impotent and not worth following, or he is uh, all powerful, but therefore he decides not to, therefore he's evil or he has some shade of evil within him, so we rebel. That is the thesis that is put forward to the Christian, and many people find it to be, to be compelling. I do not. And here's why. And you know what? Before we go into it, I'm going to put one thing out there. I'm going to try to answer this today, and many, many wise theologians have. The answer to the problem of evil cannot satisfy your hurt and sorrow mm. when you are asking that question in the most profound way. What I mean by that is the answer to the problem of evil, why evil exists, is no more comforting than the explanation of what an exothermic reaction is when chemicals are put together and a firing pin is, is uh, capped in a grenade on the battlefield to the family who are sitting there at the military funeral, an explanation of why and how exactly their brother father, mother, sister, whoever died, doesn't console them. The answer to the problem of evil cannot console you. It's just an understanding of why evil is in this world if there is a good God. Let me explain. If God is all-powerful, are there things that God cannot do? It's a, it's a phenomenal question. So... If you were asking that question, you're, you're actually conflating a couple of things. Yes. If God is timeless, spaceless, and material, and he can provide uh, any, any uh, you know, he could speak and it comes into existence. In that sense, he's all powerful. He's outside of time and space. But if logic, love, morality, Mathematics are all part of the essence of God. If God is those things and he breathed into existence, the universe, he spoke and the universe poof came into being. And all of those things are an outcrop from the essence of God. Then God cannot lie. He cannot make a circle square. He cannot make red blue. There are things that God yeah. cannot do by the sake of logic. He cannot make a stone so big that he cannot lift it. That doesn't mean that he's not all powerful in the sense of being in timeless space, and material being it means he can't defy the rules of logic. So God allows free will. Uh oh, there's an argument that people recoil at. Couldn't God have created a perfect world where man in their free will interacted and never committed evil. And I think this particular topic ties in really well with the fifth one that we're doing. And that is the issue of freedom. Now it's, it's not a direct link, but it goes to the same. It goes to the same premise, because free will is is an interesting thing. It is the most important thing to God in this universe, and the reason I say that is because He made a flawless universe, but He put in free will agents, and He allowed them to wreck the order of the universe. It was their choice. 
Why did he do that? Why did he create free will agents? Well, first off, if he created something other than that, mm -hmm. we would be no different than a Venus flytrap opening and closing its mouth in response to stimulus for sustenance, right? We would be this, this thing that is just moving back and forth. And we're robotic. We're robotic. It's something without agency. Mm -hmm. God wanted to create free will agents that are eventually going to be his children. He gave us the opportunity. The problem is, is where there's an opportunity to love, there's an opportunity to hate. Yes. Where there's an opportunity to build, there's an opportunity to destroy. So God allowed that opportunity. Is that God creating evil? Was the Garden of Eden a setup? I would say no. Right. I would say that God is allowing for man to do that. Well, why doesn't God stop bad things? And by the way, what was the one, uh, one of the main things behind 9-11? Where's God? Where's God? Why didn't he stop that? That's a good question. And, you know, what's interesting about that question is where did you find a lot of people after 9-11? All of a sudden the churches the were churches three, were filled. four, five times filled. For three months. And then where did they go? So... I think the the way you've laid this out to start is really, and I would encourage people that are listening, if if you if you don't feel like you grasped the first three minutes here, you should re rewind and go through this again because it is all about understanding, and it's not the way that we think it ought to be. It is the way that God has ordained it to be. Because he's in, in, in ordains, so people get confused when you say that. You say that God is the author when he ordains something. Yep. No, no, yep. he's no more the author than if you appoint or an elect someone with authority. Let's say that we, we have ordained that there is to be a sheriff in our county. Yep. And that yep. sheriff acts outside of the bounds of his. Did we act outside the bounds of, of, of righteousness if that sheriff takes bribes or lets. Mm thieves out of prison, or maybe say he arrests people or he shoots someone that he shouldn't have. Did we do that? Or did the free will agent that was ordained to do that? It's great. Go and go great and use. clarification. So God is not the author of evil, but he is the author of free will. Mm -hmm. So the question is not, why does God allow evil? It's why does he allow free will? And, and the root of that is this, God wants an intimate relationship more intimate than father and child, more intimate than husband and wife, but it's a spiritual intimacy. Don't, don't bring the physical into it. It is something that is a closeness, a deep bond. To have a relationship like that, especially in today's age of informed consent, and may I, you know, do I consent to touch you? May I kiss you? May I cut your hair, right? That you should be able to appreciate it more than ever. God wants you to understand who he is and what he is before he puts you into a romantic relationship with him. And I use that word very, very loosely. It is deeper than romance. It is a spiritual bond where the two become very, very similar because that is the only way that you can have a heaven is if everyone has a similar heart and mind. So let's ask a few quick questions here, things for people to consider, to, to contemplate, think about. If you did not have free will, would you have the ability to love anyone? Mom, dad, whatever. Husband, husband wife, brother, husband, sister. Wife. Would you have the ability to show kindness? The, again, the question is this. If, if God did not give you free will, would you be able to, would you be able to speak well of someone? Well, you could, but you were predestined you were fated you're robotic that. you you're you, about the, that word that you said using the venus flytrap illustration is really the word all that's doing is reacting to external stimuli and that's just what you are chemicals that that's are bouncing right. around in, that's, that's in exactly right in a tumble rock tumbler of a universe you would not have you'd have no reason to think you would have no real ability in my mind to think and there's you're no, just you're just going through life and you the one who's writing right now in the come section i hear you typing what's your purpose in typing that mm -hmm. if you're if you're just if you're just chemicals oozing it out 
onto your phone's surface, you know, and you're just tapping it out. But uh, that's what's a great your purpose. That's the purpose of the question. What's your purpose? Yep. So, so in that world, it's not. And, and earlier, I was going to say, have you ever watched Min Minority Report with Tom Cruise? I have not. Are you familiar with the premise? I so believe I am. Yes. There's there's a there's an agency where they have these telepathic beings who can supposedly and some spoilers ahead. Okay, sorry. I'm not <laughs> I'm not, not going to go too far here, but they <laughs> but they can kind of sort of imperfectly and not well guess when someone's going to commit a capital crime. Okay. And so they send an agent out and that agent arrests the person before they shoot, but they find out that that's not exactly what it seems. If God was the perfect minority report, would that still be free will? Oh, oh. Would you understand the gift of salvation and righteousness? You, you couldn't. So just to wrap this thought up before we move on to the next, I want to say this answer is not meant to comfort a grieving mother or a grieving child with the loss of a family member. This is not meant to comfort. This is the explanation of you hit the primer, the powder burns and the bullet shoots. This is not meant to comfort that person. The only comfort that you can find in those times is relationship. Yeah. And it, it doesn't take away the pain, it soothes the pain. And I think this is a really strong point to make because the issue of evil is one of the most difficult to um, articulate because a as Christians we're not prepared to articulate it that's that's one or if we are mm -hmm. we use it to comfort and that is the worst thing it's that the you wrong can do. thing yeah you, you yeah. have to do it with religion sorry no I, I, and, and I and I and I think secondly when it, it's because we're not thinking about why there is evil if we don't have free will, we do not have evil, but you also don't have love. Correct. It's so now, now we're at an issue of, okay, is God who is, is God who he says he really is. And, and, the, that and then let's take it from there. That's right. Let's take it from there because the, the it, point of evil does not discredit God. If anything, it, the real, it confirms him. Another question should be, why is there any good? Uh huh. But that's another, that's another philosophical point. You won't, in front of the you point. won't hear those questions being asked though, when somebody's Correct. going through what you're talking about. So, so just remember that answer is not meant to comfort. You can find relationship in Jesus Christ. You can find relationship in your family. You can yes. find relationship in your church family or in your friends. That is where you find the comfort in the horrible loss that most people find themselves in when they ask the question, if there's a God, how could he have let this happen? So just remember that if you're sharing with someone, that is not the time to bring out your apologetics. That is the time to bring out your soul and your heart Amen. as a Christian. Amen. So moving on to the next question for the day. The Christians in the church, how are the Christians in the walls of the church one of the most common reasons why people leave the faith, Mr. Charlie? There's a number of them. Um, one of the top ones, though, is the issue of hypocrisy. Now, before we go any further with this particular topic, I want to make it really clear about a couple things. Number one, you can go to your local club meetings, your, your bridge club, your pick your favorite club, and you're going to find hypocrisy. It, it's everywhere. I think part of the issue is that when people come to church, sometimes it's the very first thing that they're looking at and looking for because they want a reason not to come to church. You're looking for another reason to run from God. So I'm going to say that. Let me push back a little bit. Go ahead. Some, some, some viewers just recoiled. And bit. they probably, yes. But I would also say that it is entirely fair to say, if this person is a student of Jesus, what does that make Jesus? Hmm. And so I, I, I want to lay this out real quick before you no, keep go going. Ahead. No one blames Beethoven, Handel, Bach, or Mozart for a six-year-old banging on the piano. No one blames them for that. Right. If, if a child is smashing the keys and they say, I'm playing Handel's Messiah or the seventh movement, yep. we're all going to roll our eyes and say, okay, he's a child. Yep. 
guess what you should do when you come into church and you find hypocrites? Roll your eyes and say, they're a child. Yep. Move on. And, and, and that, that goes to the heart of, look, what is your purpose for coming to church? Is it the people? Is it the people? Or is there a relationship there you you're go. searching for? Are, are we looking for Jesus? And there are, let me also say this, there are hypocrites in church. The church is filled with them, filled with them. You probably could, could watch me throughout this next week and you would find something that would be hypocritical about, about me and, and being called a Christian. Okay, I understand that. I get that. I strive every day to make sure that that can't happen. But I am, I am part of a fallen race and we can only keep striving. We can only keep moving and allowing the Lord to sanctify us day by day. So if I'm doing the right things, that will happen. But that's one of the, the main reasons. Second one, we just we we talked about um, in a different segment here, and it's the issue of human suffering, evil. And I totally get that. This comes from another topic, another reason why people uh, leave, and it's because of the the low knowledge, the low understanding. Which we'll talk about in a moment. We will talk about that in a moment. And we're going to get deeper with that, but it's the lack of knowledge in among other Christians, among other Christians. And I want to say this friend, if you're listening and you don't, you don't agree with our points and you don't, you don't, um, you just like John Arthur said a moment ago, you recoil, take, take a step back and make sure that you've done your studying to understand properly that particular statement. If you knew my heart, you would you would understand where I'm coming from, and I'm not I'm not trying to give an excuse for Christians to act how they want to act and be hypocritical in church. I'm not doing that. What I'm saying is, you've got your eyes in the wrong place. Every time that you put your eyes on another person to meet a standard, you are going to find that they will fail. They will fail. There are numerous reports of pastors who have, have done the sexual abuse thing. Yeah, and you go, there's no place for God in my life because of that. Okay, I get that. I hear you. My question is, are you trying to live a standard by what that man or that woman did? Or are you trying to live a standard to a holy God that has already lived it? That's what you need to be thinking about not living your life according to a set of rules. That's not how we live. We live according to grace. And yeah, there should be punishment for sin. But grace, there's got to be a place for that. Also remember, wherever you set your standard is arbitrary. And you can always find someone with a better standard or a lower standard than you. So that, and, and that's the issue of standards. You can compare yourself to other Christians. You can compare yourself to people outside the walls of the church. You can compare yourself to Hitler or to Mother Teresa. Okay. You can compare yourself to any of those. Guess what happens when someone comes along and they have a higher or a lower standard? So does that mean that we should all have a subjective standard or we put the objective standard on God and we say that humans are generally terrible? And God is perfect, mm. but aspire to be like, like Christ. But go That's ahead. That's good. Another one that people leave the church, conflict in the world. So Conflict in the world. Are, are you on this slide right now? Is that what I am. Okay. And if you scroll you down. to help me out. Yeah. So if you scroll down, folks, on that a little bit, um, John Arthur, if you can go down just a there's, little. There's no scroll. Oh, you can't. Okay. You may not be able to see it there, and I'm sorry, folks. We'll give you the links. But there is a line, uh, and I'm taking the top five this from is the Barna second. Study. Yes, this is a Barna study. You gotta introduce it. Second column. Yeah, my fault. <laughs> my bad. Uh, second column there from the left, and that is from a survey that they did. And that column is all Christians, those that identify as Christian. So this is one of the top ones: um, conflict in the world. Now, if you had a proper biblical worldview. You should not be leaving the church because of conflict in the world. It should push you to do greater things to impact the world. Are you a complainer or are you a doer? Oh, man. 
and God asked us to be mm. doers of the word. By the way, the church is actually, okay, there are a lot of Christians in the church who are just complainers and not doers. And what we're, by the way, I'm not saying that being on a podcast is being a doer either. You need to impact people's lives. Amen. You need to go out and you talk to people you need to do. The actual work of getting involved in someone's life is dirty, it's nasty, it's grungy, it's not fun. You deal with people's uh, uh, drama, but you're part of their life and you are there, that love of Christ in their life. Absolutely. And then the fifth one um, that I identified here, this kind of blows my mind, woke Christianity. People leave because of woke Christianity. And I, to me, it's almost nauseating to say those words together. If there was any place that wokeness should not be found, it's within the church. Well, it should be sola scriptura. I mean, that's the whole- Amen. Only the divine revelation of God. Yeah, yep. So that's a, a really interesting piece there. There's something else though. There's another slide that, um, John Arthur, if you would, if you'd pull this one up, this really segues in a very interesting way to reasons people are leaving the church. And this was a question, again, this is a Barna study. This was asked more of seniors, older people, okay? But here's what the question was. I wanna read this for everybody. If you had to pick, and this question is being asked of pastors, uh, I'm sorry, it's being asked of the older people about their pastors. If you had to pick which of the following life events do you feel most least equipped to minister someone through, select up to seven. Number one, which means the least equipped, mental illness. You see, that's a problem. That's a major problem. Because we've, well, there's a couple things going on there. We've A, over-prescribed. Yep. By the way, just I'm not telling you to get off of your meds. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's a lot of people who've been overprescribed medication. We have overanalyzed everything to the point where we prescribe a med for everything. So there's some intimidation there. Noted. You still have the answer in Christ. And 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 I'm not one of those people who says, by the way, a lot of people say just more Jesus, more Bible. That is not an answer. You there is medical issues. Th there's medical issues. And just like some people have a hard time with temptation in some ways, some people have a harder time with biblical study. They're not as intelligent. Some people aren't as intelligent. Some people are more, and that leads them to pride, right? Everyone has their own little struggle. Yep. Some of us have medical issues, and that means that you have a harder hill to climb. Yeah. And medication can help with that, bada, bada. Bing, but guess what? God is still the answer to the Amen. problem. You have a harder hill to climb. You should cling tighter. Yep. In addition to getting all the help you need, get all the help you need. Keep going. Second one was retirement planning. Now, of all the things, if of, of anything on this list that really should be near the bottom of being least equipped. Should be pretty easy. That one should have been way easy. I don't know why that's the pastor's job, but guess what? The pastor does have the answer. Amen. He does. Preserve, you know, a, a righteous man leaves yep. a possession and an inheritance for his children. That's part of living in a wise way. By the way, just while we're picking on millennials and Zoomers, the boomers did a really bad job of that. Yep. As far as the country, yep. they bankrupted the country. But anyway, keep going. The other couple of things that I want to bring out here that I thought was very interesting because we just talked about five top reasons of people leaving the church. Remember, this is a question that was asked about pastors, the most equipped to handle grief or loss. Now, folks, it, it just really, it, it really makes me go, whoa. You know, when we talk about the, the evil stuff that we talked about, just a, the problem of evil, the problem yeah. of evil. And I'm not, what it kind of tells me is that we're, we're not articulating it very well yep. at all. So folks, there's going to be issues within the church. You've got people that um, are hypocritical. Pastors, if you're listening right now, the couple things that I just read should have shook you to your core. If, if you do not understand how to articulate about the issue of mental illness, you do not sit there and continue to preach 
on, on, on Matthew 5. Ma- and Matthew 5 is a great place to preach from. The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. Uh, For those of you totally. not willing to look it up. Yeah. Just... I'm just telling you, you should be sitting there going, oh, my goodness. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Amen. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who, yeah. So I, I think those are some very important points. And I, I hope people really take a moment to evaluate this. Absolutely. So just remember, everyone has, you know, an armpit and they all stink. Amen. Everyone has their hypocrisy. And that includes you, uh, the Christian in the church. Don't let that be an excuse. Make sure that you actually make a decision. If you do not want to choose God, by the way, don't, don't, if you don't want to, it, you really, if, you have to decide that you're going to submit to God. And that means giving yourself over saying, look, I understand that I'm imperfect. If you're not willing to say that, I have no, I have no desire to push you. I'm, I'm just going to tell you that there, there are consequences for that. But guess what? Uh, don't blame it on the other hypocrites because in doing so, Yep. You're being one. You're yep. You're being one because everyone is a hypocrite. I'm sorry, at the end of the day, humans are terrible. Last thing I want to bring out there too. Go ahead. When it comes to claiming to be a Christian, folks, we've done a podcast on this too. Little Christ follower. Mm-hmm. If if you are not following Christ, I would question whether you should be claiming that title. Amen. And and I know there's people typing right now. I've been a Christian all my life. I have a question for you. How much are you following Christ? How much do you read the words of Christ? How much do you do the actions that Christ commanded you to do? If you're not doing those things, you and I are not operating on the same dictionary. Indeed. In fact, Dennis Prager said in a, by the way, actually, we're not going to reference it today directly, but in the description uh, below that there's actually a uh, talk that Dennis Prager gave. And in it, he says, do not take the Lord's name in vain. Doesn't mean say, oh my God, that was a great baseball hit. That's not what that means. It means bearing the name of God, saying I am of God and not truly believing it. Mm. Misusing the name of God. That is a terrible, terrible sin. What a word. God, God does not like counterfeits representing his name. So just think about that for a moment. Just think about that. And with that said... We're going to move on to the next commonly referenced reason for leaving the church. The next commonly referenced reason for leaving the church is the disdain for the God of the Old Testament, the evil God of the Old Testament. What are some of the common charges against the God of the Old Testament? He killed so many people. Okay. There's so much bloodshed, so much violence. Doesn't like women, allows kids to be stoned by their parents. On that note, I actually want to take Dennis Prager for just a moment, and I do want to introduce, this is a great little bit that he did, The Rational Bible. He did this in 2018. Uh, he did this talk at a uh, the School of Public Policy in Pepperdine, and I think it is a brilliant little breakdown of one of the laws of God in the Torah. So let's go ahead and watch this real quick. We're going to watch it for a couple minutes. Give you an example. There's a law in Exodus that if you have a particularly awful child, a, uh, a wayward son, as it's sometimes called, and uh, you take him to the, uh, the elders, that is the court of your city, and if they find him guilty, they will stone him. Ooh. And everybody uses that as an example of how primitive the Bible is. Terrible Actually, God. I show, and nobody has yet contravened this, that it is one of the great moral advances in history, that law. You know why? The, the, the Torah brilliantly took killing children out of parents' hands forever. In every society, parents could kill their children. Can you pause that real quick? The Bible. And guess where we have put it today, folks? Back into Back our Back into hands. our own hands. Yep, Keep go ahead. Going. Same reasons. Well, brilliantly ended that possibility take him to the elders. But we don't have a single instance in Jewish history of elders stoning a kid. So it was, it ended the killing of children, but still under the rubric of keeping parental authority. This is the mind of God here. If it just said you can't kill your child, it would have, just would have continued. 
Same with slavery. Okay, no slaves. Everybody would feel good today. Oh, look, it says no slaves. Instead, it made slavery humane and showed God hates slavery because the biggest act he does after creating the world is take slaves from, from bondage to liberty. And finally, there's a law in, uh, I love the obscure laws because th that's why my commentary is worth it's uh, twenty three ninety five or whatever is being charged. Shameless plug. Here, I buddy. show the obscure laws have great uh, power, moral power. There's a law that if an ox gores a human, you kill the ox. Doesn't seem right. What does an ox know? You can't hold an ox responsible. Can't, you know, the ox didn't debate. Oh, you know, I know it's wrong to kill, but I do have horns after all, so... <laughs> got to use them. Why do we kill an ox that killed a human? To show how bad taking human life is. That's the whole reason. So, by the way, watch the whole video. It's very interesting. He goes on to give the explanation of, of his personal experience with that. He was, at a, he was at someone's house where they said, oh, yeah, that's the ostrich outside that uh, killed my father. Stomped his head in. It's like Jerry or whatever. It, the, 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 the ostrich that trampled to death my dad. And he says, you know what? It, it, that, that's a terrible affront to that farmer's father. Like, look at, look at that memory, the mento of that. And, and you're bragging about it. And, you're, and, and kind of, to an extent. So there is, there is an order to it. And it also allows you, by the way, violent animals tend to continue to be violent. Um, not always the case, I understand. But uh, let's not go down the whole pit bull route. But there is a reason for that. By the way, it also inflicted a cost on the owner. Yes. Who did not keep it. Yep. If the owner did not keep that, that, that uh, ox pinned up, the owner was responsible for the manslaughter. And they could either be put to death or they'd have to pay a, dow or a dowry or a uh, alimony, excuse me, for the rest of that man's family's natural life. Can you life. imagine? It's a big deal. That's a huge deal. And that's so much better than our current system. Yeah. And God lays it out. Look, if you want to talk about how God was was uh, sexist against women, no, no. Women were terribly mistreated in, in that time. And one of the things that God required was a dowry. Oh, 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 how many camels does it take to buy your daughter is the joke that comes out. The camels weren't to buy the daughter. The camels or whatever the dowry was, was given to the father to invest, grow, prosper, so that if the daughter was mistreated, she already had part of the man's wealth, hmm. that she could go back to her father's house. She wasn't to remarry, but she was supposed to be taken care of. <laughs> she, she was well, she was tended to for the... For the rest of her life. For the rest of her life. God still has a morality on divorce. He says, you can't just divorce for no reason, but... Even the, the words in Exodus are, if he fails to um, uh, give her the duties and the responsibilities and the love of a wife. Yeah. Yeah. So even if the guy didn't kiss her enough, she could say, I'm taking the dowry and I'm leaving. And that dowry was kept in the father's house until he passed away. And that dowry was an inheritance for the daughter. And whatever was invested came back to the family. You ask me how I know this. A, Jewish history. B, the Bible itself talks about Rachel and, and um, uh, Leah and how they, when mm -hmm. Jacob says, we're going to flee, is that okay with you? What is Laban to us? He has already spent, our father has already spent and squandered our dowry. We have nothing left here. It was supposed to come to us. It has been stolen. So the, the laws of the Bible are different. The time was barbaric and evil, and God worked miraculously through laws like, you can kill your kids, but you got to take them to the judges first. And all the judges would always say, well, wait, excuse me? If you really look at your, your Bible and you, you read it the way you should, you don't have to be a rock scientist to understand that God actually has a very high, high regard for women. I mean... Can we talk about Jesus at the at the well? I mean, of all the situations, he could have dropped the hammer on her and did not. And and said, 
go and sin no more. Don't, don't be doing this anymore. There's, there's a number of different places where we can see that God was on the side of women and absolutely held them in high regard. Uh, the first two that went to the tomb and found it empty, who were they? Women. Women. And by the way, that would not be something that the average it, Jew, that's Jewish right. man would have made up. That would have been a shameful thing. It was shameful yep. for Peter and John to have been the second set to come because a woman's testimony at the time, by the way, patriarchy, real thing. Okay. Guess what? Uh, that is the natural way of humans, a, a complementarian perspective or egalitarian, depending on how you use those words can only be found in the Judeo-Christian ethic, mm -hmm. okay? And yeah. I, I lean more towards complementarianism than egalitarianism, but uh, meaning that they are different, but they're equal in worth and value. They complement each other, but they're not necessarily the same. I'm sorry, most women should not be on a uh, construction line, yeah. whereas most men are not as good in a nursery, even just physically. It's just, it's not, it's not the same thing. So the Bible, you have to look at it in the context of the time and you have to look at the context of what God was doing with those laws. You want to talk about the millions who were wiped out. These are terroristic nations who were literally attacking Israel for no reason. These are people who bred, a lot like today, by the way, dear left, bred to kill their babies. Specifically, they bred to have infant sacrifice. Let that sink in. They were less That's animal like. People, there were less people sacrificed in fire because God stopped yep. that practice than would have been otherwise. You cannot allow those sorts of people to continue to attack innocent folks and sacrifice their own if you are a good God. Is God good? Yeah. Is there a point where he says, you've had all your free will, you've devolved to the point where there's no coming back for your society, and I will stop your society? Actually, yeah, God, God does say that. Yep. He said it to the Canaanite people over and over again, and they kept doing the same thing. So is God evil for that? Well, is God good? That's the first question. Is there, Why is there good? Okay, see back to the first, first segment. segment on this you know week and go from there. Any other thoughts before we move on to the next point? No, that's good. The anti-intellectualism inside the church, <laughs> the lack of intellectual integrity, consistency, or just lack of intellect within the church. I'm actually going to say something. I, I, I do think this is one of the most common reasons why people uh, say that they have left the church is a lack of integrity uh, intellectually or the lack of um, uh, scientific rigor within the church. Guilty. Most of the church, guilty. Guess what? In the 1800s, we allowed secular humanism to take over science excuse me, to take over science, and they instituted a scientism. What I mean by that is a view of cosmogony that is religious, because you don't, you can't repeat the Big Bang. By the way, in the 1800s, they didn't believe in a Big Bang. They believed that the universe was, was an eternal construct, something that the Greeks and the Romans believed for years and years and years. But Christians and the pastorship largely gave over to the secular humanist the territory that had been the churches for so long. Who were some of the greatest minds of the last two uh, millennia? Galileo, yeah. Newton, uh, Faraday. You want to keep going? You've got uh, Kepler was a Kepler. Mathem mathematician. Why did they? Why did they search for laws of the universe? This goes back to a podcast we did recently. Laws are a reflection of reality, or rather they're a codification of reality. If there's a lawgiver in morality, there should be a lawgiver in the universe, and the universe has simple things that are true across the board because it came from an ordered mind. That is why we have the laws of thermodynamics. That is why we have an understanding of outer yes. space as good as we did, because people were looking for the imprint of that intelligent designer. By and large, the church has dropped that. By the way, the Big Bang only came around in the 60s, 50s, 60s, as a codified reality. Oh my goodness, we actually do have a beginning to the universe. 
And the secular humanists put that 13.4 or 8 billion year, 14 million year uh, time slot on it only recently because it's gotten longer and longer and longer. And guess what? They ran into some problems recently. I actually want to play this. This guy is responding. He's an atheist. He's responding to the uh, latest discovery that uh, some of these galaxies are further out than we had thought before. And they would have had to be informed in the Big Bang theory as it currently sits in a much, much, much shorter time than would have been possible by any of the current calculations. But here's his response to it, and then Mr. Charlie and I are gonna respond. You may have seen claims that the James Webb Space Telescope has debunked the Big Bang with discoveries of galaxies that predate the universe itself. But I'm afraid by this your dating isn't system. True. So here's what really happened. And model. Astronomers discovered a few galaxies that appear to have first formed 13.4 billion years ago just 350 million years after the Big Bang. This tells us that the first generation of galaxies were born much sooner than we had previously thought. While this is exciting news, this hasn't broken the Big Bang and proved that science was wrong all along. Actually, it proves that your theory, not science, your theory was wrong all along. And the deeper you dig, the more you have to change the theory. It's ever changing. And guess what? That's okay. Because we have a theory that has been around for 6,000 years. I, God, God spoke, the universe rapidly expanded in a harsh thing of light. And then all of a sudden as it cooled down, it darkened and there was the first day and it was day and night. Oh wait, we've had that theory for a lot longer and we haven't had to change. Mm. I, I was gonna tell everybody <laughs> that, that people were probably going to be mind blown by this statement. I am a believer in the Big Bang. God spoke and bang, it was there. And the universe expanded rapidly. We believed in a rapidly expanding universe from that one incident incitement point in time, they call it the singularity. We say the moment that God spoke, the universe was rapidly formed and created. Red light shift is just as much a problem for the atheist as it is for us. The time and travel and distance of light is a problem for the atheist just as much as it is for the Christian. Now, we do have responses to that. Dr. Jason Lyle is a phenomenal astrophysicist, a credentialed guy, really sharp, and he has multiple explanations for the movement of light through our universe. Primarily, it sits into this. We have an explanation for the travel of light from 14 billion year, light years away. The The 14 billion light years away is an estimate based on a standard. The speed of light is not a law. 186,000 miles per second is not a law. It's not even a constant. From Earth's gravity to the uh, orbit, the speed of light is different, albeit a fractionally different. We are sitting not in the center of our solar system, not in the center of our galaxy, but rather in a pocket in our galaxy, in a safe pocket. But our galaxy does happen to be surrounded by a set of larger and larger rings of galaxies, okay? We're in the center of a gravity well. All of the galaxies that we can see with the naked eye had much less, or had a much higher gravitational tug on the outside than do the light uh, rays, waves, particles, what have you, mm -hmm. whatever you want to believe about what light is, a waving particle. As it gets closer to the center, it will slow down. So those billions of light years away are measured at 186,000. The Christian has a response to this. We all have the same evidence. The question is not, is uh, 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 Christianity in denial of science? No, we have to interpret the same evidence and we have to be clear on whether it's true or not. I think one, one point real quick, John Arthur, that I think should be noted here pastors you should not avoid you should not avoid speaking to the issue of science amen you should be embracing that and running with it it's the consequences for not will leave you in a place where you're anti-intellectual they'll lead you to parishioners and to potential christians people who have fallen to the believe Jesus heresy, by the way, believe Jesus is not what the Bible says. It says that you confess with your mouth. That means that you're saying that Christ is my Lord. I am going to change. Mm -hmm. 
and you confess your sins, right? And you bow your knee, you change, you give yourself over. Saying a magical prayer does not make you a Christian. Amen. And in deconstruction, I promised we'd get there. In deconstruction, you often have people who were never truly bought in. That's right. And they're, they're sitting there wondering, they're like, they're trying to make it work. They're honestly trying, right? But they haven't been given the tools or equipped. And Rhett and Link are two very, very famous internet individuals yep. who had a deconstruction moment. This is them on the Howie Mandel show. And I wanna show this one clip. This is what it looks like for someone who has not been given that opportunity to actually flesh out their faith. And when they come to the pastorship or the laity, they're rebuffed. And this is the fruit of this sort of uh, spiritual malpractice. The first time I told her, I mean, listen, we didn't believe that evolution happened. We, we believed that Adam and Eve were real. We, you know, we, we believed that what is in the book of Genesis was like history. And so when was I, there a moment where this came, where you, you had a flash and you went, wait, 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 wait. Uh, it was like a, I started reading about this in my early twenties and I, but mostly what I would do is I would go and I would be like, I, okay, there's, there's all these people selling, saying that the earth is, you know, 10,000 years old. But like, every time I go to a museum, they're like, this thing lived millions of years ago. I never, I never looked into this, but I started reading about it. And actually I started reading from like, I, I would go to Christian sources, right? And there's a lot of Christians who don't believe that there's a lot of Christians who believe in evolution, right? There's a lot of Christians who believe that world is old or whatever, and kind of accept the established science. And so I would slowly read these sources and kind of my view was uh, changing. But then when it was like, uh, I, but that's, I don't know how to reconcile this particular thing about, well, if we're, if we're have this common ancestor with chimpanzees and, you know, apes and uh, well, Adam and Eve, well, how do you explain that? I would start asking these questions and then I would like go to my pastor, go to these other people. I would ask them questions and I didn't get satisfactory answers. And then it just was like a house of cards that was slowly falling until I remember writing in my journal, I was journaling at the time. Uh, I was like, I'm pretty sure I don't believe any of this stuff anymore, right? But all along the way, I would tell, like when I told my wife that I thought evolution had happened, she burst into tears. I just wanna give you an idea of what, where we come from wow. and the worldview that we were all sort of held captive to. And so, but the funny, the funny thing is, is that- I, But I, I never reacted that way. No, I'm so like, I- so they go on to describe how Rhett brought Link along with him into the agnostic sort of space. Okay. And, and, and look, you need to remember that humans are human and God is God. But guess what? You also are told to have a reason yes. for the hope in which you believe. Like you're supposed to, and that's what the apologist, apologia, means to give a response. It's not to apologize. It is the same root, yep. but it means to give a response, a written debate, a, a literate response. You and know, the, the one heartbreaking piece, the statement, the one heartbreaking statement, I went to my pastor with these questions. That's it. And he couldn't answer them. Now look, pastors, Please, please don't misunderstand this. We're not saying that you should have every single answer, so on and so forth. The response from that particular pastor should have been, you know what? I don't understand fully that answer. Can we dig together? Amen. At the very least, if you're not willing to dig with me, so be it. But I'm going to find the answer. That's it. And then I'm going to relay that to the whole body. So now it's not just him that's getting the question answered. It's everyone. Now it's everyone. And that's where the pastorship has royally failed. Yes. The laity, my gosh, I keep doing that. I see why you keep doing that. Mr. <laughs> the laity royally fails. Like we have yes. done a terrible job of being in the Bible, also in the sciences. Yes. And so an the, the anti-intellectualism in the church is, is a real concern. But what I would say is this, we actually do have responses. Those do exist. And, and they're adequate. Yeah. They, I mean, look. No, they're, they're the when, best. They're the absolute best. The best answers that anyone could give. By the way, I, I don't know if he's an actual Christian or not, but it's kind of fun. Yeah. The, 
I got so many things. Better than adequate. I'm sorry. <laughs> it just blew my mind on that. I'm sorry. But the, the thing is, guys, is that there are answers. There are people that have studied these things through and they have appropriate responses. Yes. When you talk about Jason Lyle, that is a leading scientist that, that, that stands on so many scientific grounds in support of the Bible. And he's done a good job articulating it. Yeah, he's done a phenomenal job. He's not the only one, but the point is that, folks, there are answers to these questions. And if you're not getting them with your pastor, that doesn't mean you quit on God. That's not what that means. That means you should kind of maybe back up and understand, okay, well, maybe this isn't the church for me, but at the very least, I, Charlie said there was answers. Somebody's got to have them. What did you always tell your kids to run towards? Truth. Always run to truth. Always run to truth. It'll save you a lot of heartache. Amen. So here's the short on this. You can be a Christian and an intellectual. Amen. You can be a Christian and you can, and look, you can not be a Christian and be an intellectual. I'm not saying that it's incapable of that, but I will say this. The greatest minds of science were Christians who were pursuing excellence. The whole reason we have laws in physics and we have a codified, you know, those, those laws would be there with or without humans, but the codification, the writing down of those laws in the description by and large came from Christians. If not from Christians, it came from people with the Judeo-Christian mindset who knew that there was an order and there was a reason and that order and reason came from a mind. So the Christian faith is not anti-intellectual. It is not anti-science. We might be against scientism, the worship of science, yes. the exalting of it over God. Okay. We believe in science. We believe that science is a very credible tool. No more so or no less so than I think that a internal combustion engine is a great thing. I don't worship my car. So, and make sure that you are focused on truth, because if you are, it will lead you to God and you can be an intellectual and a Christian. Now, the final reason that we're going to cover today, common reason for people leaving the church is the desire for freedom. They find that Christianity is restrictive. Here is an article, and by the way, link in the description below, but here's a graph from an article uh, from a guy named Flannery on uh, baptistnews.com, I believe it is. Yep. Now, he is not what I would call a um, standard evangelical conservative. He's an ex-gay pastor. So consider this somewhat of a opposition uh, uh, study that he did. He did a poll on his uh, social media. And I thought it was interesting because the questions that he asked were interesting. The initial reason for most of these people leaving the Christian faith. Okay, go look at the study. He did a halfway decent job for an online poll. Almost, I'm gonna call it a study, but it had a thousand something respondents that qualified as having left from a Christian denomination. So the most common initial reason for leaving was the LGBTQ issue in the way that the church hates, quote unquote, hates those in the LGBTQ community. Number two was the behavior of believers. We talked about that today. Intellectual integrity, we talked about that today, was uh, uh, an issue for 12%. Exposure to uh, difference, a uh, differing opinion, 11.71. Christianity wasn't strong enough or presented in a strong enough light to give them any staying power. Faith of the leader in the leadership, okay? Those are the top five. Now, the issue of the LGBTQ uh, treatment, that is something that I think is really interesting, and it is a real uh, concern. Those were the initial reasons for, for considering leaving the faith. Now, if we go down to the final reason for leaving, LGBTQ issue, behavior, believers, politics, those are the top three. And what's interesting about the politics? Donald, Donald, Donald Trump, Trump. Donald Trump and abortion. Those are the two things, Donald Trump and abortion. And they would say, well, Donald Trump is mean. Donald Trump is this. It's like, okay, look. They've equipped. They've, they've, I don't care. I don't care if he's mean. I care if he stops babies from being murdered in utero. Yeah. 
I care if he doesn't do a precipitous withdrawal from Afghanistan. I care if we are the number one nation in foreign policy in the world, and therefore the world is safer. And we, we covered this on an early podcast years ago. Is imperialism bad? Guess what? There's going to be an empire. I'd rather it be the United States than China, Cambodia, Russia, any of those leaders, uh, North Korea. Not that Cambodia is a threat, but I'm saying someone with that mental mm -hmm. ilk, talking about the killing fields. I would rather someone who is in a Judeo-Christian background, by and large, be the imperial power in the world. Make no mistake, the United States is an empire. Noted. It is a hegemonic force. Noted. In the last thousands of years, a few thousand years, when have you had this much global peace as in the last 80 since World War II, when the British gave over their empire to the United States? De facto, they gave it over. Mm -hmm. You've never had this much peace across the world. So yes, that's okay to have that, to want that. Do you want to have, the one thing I do think that conservatives have, have done with Trump that was wrong, a lot of conservatives have elevated him to the position I, I was going to say, they, they put him up on a pedestal. He's not a messiah. Amen. He's just a dude who be hired because all of the Christians were too, forgive me, too feckless and had no constitution in their soul and being to be able to fight the fight. And, and I was, and you just nailed it. The reason that he was put on the pedestal is because he did something that previous Christians people, couldn't do. Christians couldn't and wouldn't do. And, you know, I, I'll say this about Donald Trump. Um, I think part of the issue is that he comes from a city that has a very, it, it is rough. New Yorker over here. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm from Western New York, but I've been to New York City and I have worked and serviced people in New York City. And I've had, I've had I want to share a quick story. I had a, a, a woman up in New York City that nobody in our group wanted to take a phone call from. Nobody. And I said, I'll take it. It's not a problem. And she was. She was very rough. But you want to know something? I made a trip up there on, on a number of different occasions to, to do some work. I wanted her around me because she knew that place, mm -hmm. and I, I knew she would look out for me. She wasn't mean. It was, it was part of who she was. It was. It was a part of where she lived. When you think about Donald Trump, what do people think about? It's somebody that fights for me. That's it. Isn't that really, when you think about God, Beast. when it comes to the spiritual issues, you want someone to fight don't you me. want somebody like that? Yeah. So enough on Trump, but he was a huge <laughs> issue. He was. he was a huge issue in the church, but I think he was, he, he wasn't the, Ben Shapiro said it really well when he said, he's not the murderer. He's the cor He's the mortician. Yeah. He was coming in and cleaning up the corpse. Like he's standing over the corpse, but no, he didn't kill it. Yeah. He's just mopping up the mess. You're seeing a galvanization primarily over abortion, primarily over a strong, all of the things that we just talked about that lead to a stable world. Mm -hmm. He is in favor of, and those who wish to destroy that aren't. Yeah. But back to the issue in the church and the issue of LGBTQ and the issue of politics and the issue of, uh, um, what was that one other one? The issue of the behavior of believers. What is gained with your new framework was one of the questions that was asked by uh, Flannery. And the responses were, number one response was freedom. Number two, love and acceptance of others. Uh-oh. Number three, mm -hmm. the removal of shame and guilt. Uh-oh. Now, what was lost? Let's scroll down further in the article. Link in the description below as always. What is lost? Number one, by far and away, this is the highest number for those of you on audio, highest number by far is a hockey stick graph. Number one, 56%, no, 50.95%, 50 excuse me, the loss of their community. Ding, 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 ding. Music and arts, certainty. Uh, those are the three things that were lost. If you are considering leaving the church because it is quote unquote intolerant of you, maybe it is. There are some bad churches out there. Mm -hmm. Hands down, noted, agreed. 
if you're considering leaving because you want the love and acceptance of others, find yourself a good church that does love and accept you, not as you are, but as you're meant to be. There is a difference. Key phrasing right there. A mother does not look at their child who is covered in mud and say, oh, you look so good and you're so beautiful just the way you are. What does a mother do? Picks you up, you know, when you're four years old, picks you up, drops you in the tub and scrubs you. By the way, that scrubbing can be uncomfortable, especially if that stuff is stuck. If you tangled with a skunk, you're going to get, you're in for a scrubbing. That doesn't mean that she's intolerant of you. That means she will not tolerate the condition and state that you were in. That is what God is doing when he forms a relationship with you. And by the way, that doesn't just apply to LGBT. Okay. That applies to every vice Amen. in my own life yes. and in your life and in his life. Yeah. Okay. Every vice, every stronghold in your soul that Satan has set up that applies to. So you might think that you have freedom now and you do, you have free will, but the one thing you don't have the freedom to, to have dominion over is the consequences for your choices. Amen and amen. So I can choose to rob a bank today. I do not have the freedom to decide what the consequences of that bad choice would be. You can choose to run from God and there'll come a point where he won't chase you. But eternity is real. And whether or not you believe heaven and hell are punitive, or you believe that it's a nature of God himself being displayed to you, whatever you believe, heaven is coming. And so is hell. And that's a whole nother topic. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say this to scare you because there is a God who is reaching out his hand. He's handing you a parachute on a plane that's going down. If I'm saying anything, it's to tell you not that the person with the parachute is being intolerant. It's that you're going down. You best grab onto the parachute. That's not bigoted. That's loving. I think one thing that I want to point people to, you may, you may hate God. You may disagree that God exists, so on and so forth. Understood. Jesus Christ came to this earth approximately 2,000 years ago. When you, when you consider the issue of God, when you consider whether he exists, I would urge you to start with Jesus and go to that place where can you prove that Jesus lived? Can you prove that he died? Can you prove that he was buried and resurrected? And when you come to the conclusion of that, then you have to take stock. If Jesus did those things, then the things that he said, if he is who he said he was, the things that he said have incredible ramifications for you and your life. That's where I would start. And you would not be the first person nor will you be the last that would start with something like that. There are many that have done this before you and they have come to their conclusions. I would urge you to do the same. Amen. If you enjoyed this podcast, like, comment, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Thank you for hundreds of thousands of downloads on Further Every Day. Today was an experiment. We're trying out something. We're thinking about calling it The Apologist. Not saying that we are the apologist, but rather it is a show for the apologist, a show that you can watch and hopefully uh, pick out segments and uh, enjoy a uh, quick summary of an issue. We did five today. We're going to chop them up and deliver them different pieces. Hopefully yep. you enjoy. If you didn't enjoy, there is a dislike button there. Smash it in some multiple of two the helps. Uh, I promise. With that said, thank you so much. We love you. You have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. One last thing. One last thing. I got one more thing for you. One thing for our audience to do or to remember spiritually for the week. It doesn't have to be spiritually. One thing for the week. And I'll start. Go ahead. Make sure that when you get up in the morning, spend some time in quiet, 
men in peace. Spend some time opening up the word. A long time ago, I had this uh, conversation with God where, sorry, Lord, I did this, this, and that today in the evening, and uh, I had this conviction fall on me. If you'd spent just 15 minutes with me in the morning, maybe you wouldn't spend so much time on your knees crying to me about your failures in mm. the evening. Spend some time in the morning with God. Get some quiet time in your shower, even if you're a busy person. Take a moment. Talk to God. I was very tempted to go with that one. I'm uh, So I'm glad you went with that one. I'm going to tell Sorry. you another. No, um, because this is just the Lord working here. Um, be thankful. Hmm. Acknowledge to God something that you are thankful about. And look, you may be going through the most horrific of times. I understand. It, it And it does happen. But I want to urge you, find something to be thankful about. Because I think in the giving of thanks, we come to a place where we acknowledge that God is good, and He is indeed good, even in the bad. Amen. With that, we really do not have anything else for you. We love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.